Welcome to the Performance and Accountability Board for July. I'll start with the introductions. I'm Mark Shelf and I'm the Police and Crime Commissioner for Avon and Somerset. To my right. I'm Paul Butler. I'm the Chief Finance Officer for the Office of the PCC. Chief Constable. And I'm Sarah Crew, the Chief Constable of Avon and Somerset Police. And Assistant Chief Constable. I'm Will White, Assistant Chief Constable. Thank you. During this meeting, I and my Chief Financial Officer will be putting questions to the Chief Constable and the Assistant Chief Constable. This is one way that I hold the Chief Constable to account in a transparent way. This meeting allows everybody to understand how Avon and Somerset Police are performing. And as usual, the first agenda item today is on a topical issue. And I want to start talking about institutional racism. As the people may have seen in the media, the Chief Constable has acknowledged that Avon and Somerset Police are institutionally racist. Institutional racism is defined in the McPherson Report, and a slide should be coming up with that definition. And it's important to read the definition, particularly the second paragraph. The Casey Review provided four tests which the Chief Constable could apply to Avon and Somerset Police. And again, these are shown on the slide. Within Avon and Somerset, we also uh, commissioned a report, which we've spoken about before, identifying disproportionality in the Avon and Somerset criminal justice system. And this report provided a wealth of evidence to inform the position that the Chief Constable has taken. And I want to say from the outset that I fully support the Chief Constable uh, in her decision and the position she has taken. But turning to you, Chief Constable, I have to ask, why did you say it now? Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to clarify that. So, as you say, the Identifying Disproportionality Report um, provided a wealth of evidence of um, disproportionate outcomes and experiences for people if they're black or if they're from a minority racial or ethnic group. And, but it wasn't just, you know, stop and search um, the, in the youth justice system, how we're represented in our organisation. But there were other sources of evidence to our own people survey, um, our own grievance and misconduct processes. So in March this year, when it became available, um, I applied those four tests that Baroness Casey had set out in her review of the Metropolitan Police to that evidence. Um, and upon applying those four tests, um, I found that institutional racism, by that definition, is present in the way that Avon and Somerset Police interacts with people who are black or minority, racial or ethnic backgrounds. And now, over the last year, since that disproportionality report has been published, we've been working hard to develop ways to address those disparities in experience and outcomes and at the same time implement um, recommendations from the National Police Race Action Plan that was developed um, after the murder of George Floyd in the United States. And we have come to the point of developing some really innovative and interesting evidence-based, important proposals to trial and test, and they're actually coming to the point where they're ready to be piloted. Um, but having engage widely amongst those communities. I feared that our efforts, however radical, um, and some of them are, would fail if they're done to communities, but not with. Um, I think co-creation, cooperation, meaningful joint endeavour, they're um, what was needed to make lasting change and success. And um, you know, that's how effective policing, that di dialogue between communities and the police works. It's a two-way street. And so um, I felt that if we were going to have any chance of securing input and involvement of people from those disadvantaged groups, we needed to show that we acknowledged that we had a problem first. 
um, before we can ask them to help us fix it. Now, in the days after my acknowledgement um, of institutional racism, I wrote as planned to all our stakeholders, our contacts, our critical friends, asking them to share an invitation, which has been made public, um, within their own groups, within their own networks that they represent, to invite people from their communities to become involved in the work, um, and even if they didn't want to become involved, to become informed and knowledgeable about what was happening. Um, so my statement in terms of now was to pave the way for those inv invitations so that police and those minority communities could come together to, to build a better relationship, hopefully from a basis of honesty and humility. Um, I, I've just come this afternoon from, from a meeting of Muslim community leaders, from all of the Muslim communities, and there are many of them, over 20 people um, um, here at headquarters who reinforced for me that how important that acknowledgement was to bring their involvement and the involvement of their communities in the work we need to do. So that was why now. Thank you, Chief Constable. And curiously, um, after this, I'm going straight into a car to go and talk to those same people um, at, a, at a separate meeting. Um, but I understand um, I understand about acknowledging the problem, but what I really want to understand, and I'm sure the public really want to understand, what's going to change um, now that you've acknowledged this? Well, as I say, we're starting to move to the pilot phase on three sets of proposals that we've developed as part of our local police race action plan, work that's actually led by ACC White here. Um, and those proposals are around stop and search, they're around um, something called deferred prosecution for first time offenders and a new service standard for um, black or minoritised victims of crime. Now we want to involve interested community members, people with lived experience in shaping those proposals and evaluating how work they're working, certainly before we roll them out any further. Um, we've also been consulting on an anti-racism strategy and we want advice and scrutiny on that too, not just the strategy but how we implement it. Um, and we are seeking um, and helping to, to form, though it's important that they're independent and they're formed independently, but certainly creating the conditions to do independent scrutiny groups to um, monitor the work that we're doing and I'm just hoping that my, my invitation will help people those, strengthen them, diversify them. So that's the short-term work that we're ready to go. It's on the blocks. Um, and they will prompt change in the culture because we're changing procedures, how we do things fundamentally. Um, but I, I also recognise that this is going to take much more fundamental, sustained work um, to change the culture. We have an aspiration here to um, build an inclusive culture which will inspire and strengthen the confidence of all the communities we serve in, in Avon and Somerset. So we have um, a longer term plan for culture change which sits at the heart of our five year strategic um, plan. Um, now there are many aspects to that, not just the short term hits, not just systematic changes because it is a systematic change that's needed but I think leadership and in building inclusive leadership is almost the most important um, and so work on that front um, is very much underway with your support commissioner but as we go into the autumn we start to um, roll out a new team leadership program for all our junior leaders so people stepping into a leadership role for the first time who are very much those that are supervising those people who interact with the public. So that will be the first. Um, we've talked in previous meetings about our Leadership Academy, which we'll continue to develop. So short-term wins, five-year plan, an inclusive culture, leadership at the heart of that culture change. Well, Chief Constable, thank you uh, for that. And um, I know from my time in the Army that culture change takes between five and ten years to achieve. So it's not a quick win, it is something that needs to be embedded and a, a, a long-term strategy, which I know you're um, outlining, you have just, just now, but that leadership piece is so vital to it 
to get everybody and, and give them the confidence by having those tools of leadership uh, to be able to, to make it happen. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, it's a courageous uh, decision that you've made and I'm fully supportive of it. So now I'd like to, to move to the second um, agenda item and this is the item where the public have contacted me about some of, some of their uh, concerns. Um, and this particular one is uh, uh, about unauthorised or illegal encampments. Um, this is not a new issue, but the law changed last year, creating a new criminal offence and giving police more powers. Uh, but I understand it is a really complicated area uh, for the police. So I've got a series of, of questions around this. So first, please can you tell me how you respond to unauthorised encampments? Okay, so in, these are encampments where, to, to, to clarify for people watching, where trespassers occupy land belonging to private landowners or public authorities and they do so without permission. And um, I think the term is typically associated with um, Gypsy Roma traveller sites. Um, and I think the first thing I'd want to do is um, acknowledge the challenges that are brought about by um, unauthorised encampments, and that's clearly why people are writing to you, Commissioner. Um, they often cause significant concern within communities and to local business owners. At the same time, um, moving people on to another area isn't a solution to a problem. Everyone has a right to live somewhere. And there is a shortage across the country, as well as in our area, of appropriate alternative um, accommodation. It's also important to note that the following of a nomadic lifestyle is lawful, it's protected in law. Um, and um, the, the, certainly the Gypsy Roma traveller communities are recognised through legislation as protected through um, Equalities Act and the human rights legislation. So in short, there are a lot of stakeholders and a lot of um, complexity, as you say, in managing these encampments. So it requires care, it requires consideration, and the context in each situation is critical. Now, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of legal framework that sits around this um, says that the response should always be locally driven. It should always be a multi-agency response. Um, and this is something that isn't always understood. It's one that's led by local authorities, but supported by the police. Um, and key to the context on an individual encampment is a full understanding of the circumstances. And that comes from what should happen very early, which is a visit. Um, and as long as the camp the encampment is there, several visits throughout the duration of the time um, of the police, but usually with and led by the local authority. And what that enables us to do collectively is to talk to the travellers, what are their intentions, what are the conditions on the site. It enables us to open a chain of um, communication with the landowners, especially if they're not the local authority. Um, we also and uh, give equal balance to listening to the community and engaging with them to understand what is the impact this encampment is having on that community and that includes thinking about antisocial behaviour where we have legislation but also any criminal offences that might have occurred or might be occurring in the area um, and as I say we continue to um, engage visit and because things change as, as time passes by. So we're always able to check and test our decision making on what action is appropriate in a particular case. And clearly the welfare of everyone, community, travellers, local businesses are, are the primary consideration. Now, um, it, it's right to say that the, the first response should not necessarily be, or normally even be, the use of police powers. Um, so I thought I'd, it'd be helpful to set out the circumstances where the police could become involved um, in evicting an un unauthorised encampment. Um, and so these circumstances would be, for instance, where local amenities, local services are deprived to communities or there's a significant impact on the environment. So for example, um, 
you know, an encampment on recreational land or a public park or a school field, a village green, um, or depriving the public of use of car parks. Now, it's really important that that isn't a fear, a risk. It actually has to have happened, but if those circumstances are in place, police powers may come into play. Secondly, the disruption to the local economy. So we might see an encampment on a shopping centre car park, for instance, or an industrial estate disrupting customers or workers going to that site, or even agricultural land. So that would lo in, result in a loss of use of the land or revenue, for instance. Um, so that might be another circumstance. If there's significant disruption to the local community or the environment, so that might be um, behaviour, um, which is directly related to those present on the encampment, where it's so significant that a prompt eviction by the police becomes necessary rather than any other means. So the local authority have powers here first to use that might be considered first, and um, the private landlords too. Clearly, if there's a danger to life would be another circumstance where we would become involved. For instance, um, we've seen encampments close to motorways or where there could be danger caused um, because of um, two children or because of animals maybe running across the road, etc. Um, and the final area where it may become um, necessary for the police to use powers would be where we need to take preventative action. Um, now, this is where a group of trespassers um, have, and were able to show this, persistently displayed antisocial behaviour at previous sites. Um, and we've got a reasonable belief, which is um, stronger than a suspicion, but a reasonable belief that that behaviour is going to be replicated at a new site. Um, and where there is a particular emphasis there is on private land, where the private land owner would, would take the responsibility for cleaning up the, premise, the, the, the land afterwards. Um, the legislation is clear and the, the, the government guidance is clear. The mere presence of an encampment without any aggravating factors should not normally create an expectation that the police will use eviction powers. Um, and I think it's important that that's clearly explained to, to everyone involved. We do use them and we will use them in those circumstances where they're proportionate to use. But um, as I say, those hopefully that makes a sense of what is a complex legal area. Chief Constable, one of the frustrations that um, people who get in contact with me say that the police and the council are very slow to act, particularly when there has been proven criminality around these sites. Uh, why is it it's so slow? Why does it take so long? Well, there are different um, legal notices, etc., that must be served. Um, there's evidencing of those um, conditions that have to be done. I know that it will feel slow, but I can assure um, um, the, the, the people who write to you or people who are concerned in the community, we do understand all of the different aspects of this. And as I said at the beginning, we're very clear on when we can intervene. We're really clear on the local authorities' responsibilities, the private landlords' responsibilities. We work together as a multi-agency group. Um, we act when we're proportionate and as quickly as we can, but we do need to weigh up all of the different interest parties here. Um, it, it can be quite complex, it can be quite nuanced, but, um, and we will be context-led and we, we do that. What's really important is we keep communicating and we don't always do that well, although those different... Um, activities are going on. Yes, and I think that last piece is really important from the point of view of letting the communities, all of the communities involved, know what's happening and where the stages are because then once people know that they're not so frustrated. Uh, the, the last question is probably a technical question. The law changed last year. What, what is different about the new powers that you've been given compared to the old powers? Yeah, so um, this was the Police Crime Sentencing Act 2022, which um, added um, some new legislation into an old piece of legislation called the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act, where, where our other powers over trespasses come. So, um, you know, the, the, the key points with this new um, section, if you like, Section 60C, is that, um, you know, people... Um, 
people aged, I'll, be, I'll, I'll quote it because I think it's important, people aged 18 or over um, would commit the offence if they reside or intend to reside on land without consent, so trespassing. They, um, and they have or intend to have at least one vehicle with them, so person, vehicle. Um, and they, are, they cause or are likely to cause, and I'm going to emphasise this point because this is the different bit, significant damage, disruption or distress as a result of their residing or intending to re reside on that land with the vehicle. Um, if they fail to leave as soon as they, um, as reasonably practical when they've been directed, so again there needs to be a period of notice um, after direction, um, they commit the offence. And if they return within 12 months, they also commit the offence. So I emphasise the word significant there um, because that's the change in the legislation. It brings significant damage, disruption or distress. And the legislation is new um, and it says that the police are the people who define what significant damage, disruption or distress will mean. Clearly, as things get tested in court over time, our system works on precedent what that significant definition comes to mean will become clearer and clearer and clearer but at the moment it's defined by the police and it also says under that section that if the police deem the harms not to be significant then the offence would not apply so um so in the in answer to the question has it changed our approach yes but only insofar as it offers powers to intervene when that threshold of significant um, is met, the significant damage, disruption or distress, if that threshold hasn't been reached, we fall back to the powers um, that are available to us, to local authorities and to private landlo landlords that existed before the new legislation. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, this is a subject we could go on discussing uh, for hours, but I think we're going to uh, move on now. Um, and uh, my Chief Financial Officer will now ask the next question. Thank you. Moving to Agenda Item 3, which is the Avon and Somerset Peel Report. The first area of focus within the Commissioner's Police and Crime Plan is vulnerable children and adults. There are two areas for improvement in the Peel Report that relate to this. The constabulary should make sure that repeat and vulnerable callers are routinely identified and risk assessments are effectively supervised, quality assured and checked for compliance. Please could you tell us what you're doing to improve identification and assessment of risk? When we talk about repeat and vulnerable callers, the first thing I'd want to recognise is the importance and need to identify, support and protect vulnerable members of the community when they contact us. So there's some things we can do to improve that right now, and that's primarily improving the quality and consistency of our current methods and processes. But there's also some longer term solutions that will be enabled by technology. At the minute, we're exploring a new command and control system. So that's what receives our calls and enables our dispatch of our officers. And when we do that, we're looking at customer relationship management software to be part of that. And that will enable the effective identification of vulnerability and risk at that first point of contact. So what that software would do, it would interface with other police systems and it would provide information on things like repeat calls, vulnerability flags and other knowledge so that the call handler can make a much better assessment of threat, harm and risk at that initial point of contact with the member of the public. What we're also looking at is some other solutions including a risk indicator tool and those that dispatch officers, it would allow them to identify risk and vulnerable callers based on the criteria within that tool. What was also mentioned in terms of assessing risk is uh, a specific area of improvement related to our two tools, our BRAG tool and something called a DASH risk assessment and the need to help with some of the confusion in the minds of our staff about when to use which one. So I'm just going to briefly explain about that. So BRAG refers to blue, red, amber, green and that's in terms of a, a rating of vulnerability. So what it does is um, it supports officers to identify and record vulnerability when they attend an incident. So often we pass that information on to a different agency or a different professional 
and what it does is allow the other professional to understand exactly what the officers are seen and understood at the scene in relation to that victim. So that's not a national tool, that's something we've developed because we felt there was a gap and that can pick up any kind of vulnerability that the uh, officer sees at an incident. So at the minute, rather than looking at alternatives, we're looking at how we can improve that and make it simple for our staff. So our staff have something called a Pronto mob mobile app and we're using that to make it a much more easy process for them to use at the scene of an incident when they attend. DASH stands for Domestic Abuse, Stalking, Harassment and Honor Based Violence. So that's for our officers in terms of uh, assessing the risk of serious harm to a victim of domestic abuse. That means that they can then forward that on so that victim can get the right support that they need in the situation they're experiencing. That's been looked at nationally and it's seen as an improved way of trying to do that and that's through a new tool called DARA that's looking to replace DASH next year. So we're prepared for that coming in in 2024 and we've got the necessary preparations and plans to implement that fully when it arrives. But we're not waiting for that. In the meantime, uh, we're looking to use the three key questions in relation to domestic abuse, stalking, harassment and honour-based violence on that mobile app tool for officers. And our lighthouse safeguarding unit that is our main point of contact for all our vulnerable and repeat victims to provide ongoing care and support to them and making sure that our staff are equipped and understand those new tools and their functionality. So we felt that the inspection uh, was right to what it said. We accept the area for improvement. Some of those are national changes that won't be achieved imminently, but we're prepared for when they do come in. And in the meantime, we're using uh, technology such as Pronto to take it, some of the changes now and to make things simpler and easier for our staff to identify and support those that are vulnerable or repeat callers. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm almost tempted to suggest there could be a competition between the army and the police for the number of acronyms that, that come out that we seem to use, um, DASH, DARA, PRONTO, and a whole bunch of other ones. Um, it's almost um, a spaghetti bingo. But anyway, um, thank you for your answer. And, it, and, I, and the important thing is that in this, in this area, it is being addressed and there's both a training issue but also a technical issue that's coming together to improve the service, particularly to those vulnerable uh, uh, children, which is, of course, some, a highest priority that we, that we need to do. So, so thank you for that, and it's something that I will continue to scrutinise that um, uh, progress. Uh, now, we're coming to the end of, of today's um, uh, PAB and thank you Chief Constable, Assistant Chief Constable and my Chief Financial Officer. Um, the next meeting is on the 30th of August at 11.30 in the morning. Until next time, stay safe.